Recording from the Blanket Fort studio in the slightly above room temperature confines of my office. Welcome to The Future Last Week, where we talk about cool and interesting things happening or going to happen last week. I'm your host Wyatt, and it was week 20 of 2021. On Monday from thesciencenews.org, MDMA, the key ingredient in ecstasy, eases symptoms of severe PTSD. Um, Personally, for me, this has been a pretty obvious trend that I've been seeing, but a lot of illicit drugs, at least the key ingredient in those drugs, have been proven to have a lot of therapeutic use. And those therapeutic uses usually relate to treating psychological issues like this one, for example, where they used MDMA to treat PTSD. And in this case, it's proven to be a lot more successful than they could have guessed. And I got a quote from the article that explains this. By the end of the trial, 67% of the participants who took MDMA had improved so much that they no longer qualified as having PTSD diagnosis. Among people who took placebos, 32% of the participants no longer met the criteria for PTSD at the end of the study. Those evaluations came from independent clinicians who assessed people without knowing who had taken the drug. End quote. It's important to note that in this study, they had a lot of therapy going on. Like they had weeks of therapy before, weeks of therapy during, and weeks of therapy after dosing. Kind of the theory here is is that taking that MDMA, which is considered kind of a social connectiveness drug, So if you think about alcohol as a social lubricant, this would be like the ultimate social lubricant. It allows them to bond a lot more with their therapists and kind of get what they're feeling off their chest to their therapists. Now, I really like talking about this kind of stuff, and I think that currently illegal drugs have a very strong place in the medical industry, and it's always cool to see them being able to effectively treat these mental illnesses which have in the past been considered very hard to treat. However, this story doesn't mean that just because you have a mental illness that you should go out and take ecstasy. The problem with street drugs is that they mix it with fillers and all these kind of things that are very, very dangerous to your health. The clinicians were using purified MDMA. Now, in the story, they note that MDMA is an ingredient in ecstasy, meaning that there's a lot more things in ecstasy that make it ecstasy. Definitely don't go out and take ecstasy simply because you think it can help. But anyways, that's all I got for this story, so let's go ahead and move on to Tuesday. On Tuesday from Futurism.com, doctors hack virus to make tumors kill themselves. So, scientists have developed this technique called SHRED, which is a very convenient acronym, standing for shielded retargeted adenovirus kind of how this works is they take a virus and they genetically modify it to inject this dna material into the cancer cells so that the cancer cells start to produce antibodies which are going to destroy the cancer cell from the inside out now i definitely think we need a more targeted approach like this anyways because before or currently we frequently use this thing called chemo or radiotherapy now chemo would be kind of like dropping an atomic bomb on a city full of civilians in order to kill a few random insurgents that are spread throughout the city. This method would be kind of more like using heat-seeking cruise missiles. They'd be able to find the bad actors and destroy them and leave minimal damage around them. And the nice thing about these viruses is that they don't attack healthy cells, they only attack the cancerous ones. And so they can inject you with these viruses, they infect the cancer cells, the cancer cells kill themselves, and effectively you're cured of cancer. Obviously this is still in the testing phase, but I think this is wicked cool, and I love medical developments like this. Another thing that they're planning to do with this technology is actually put it into aerosol form. And the reason that they'd want to do that is they can put it in an inhaler, so they can target infections of the lungs very directly. One of the things that they're saying that they can do is actually make a COVID vaccine that they can put in an inhaler, like you would have if you had asthma, and you would just take a hit, your lungs get full of the adenovirus, it starts producing antibodies that fight off COVID, and next thing you know, you're cured of COVID. 
and that would be a lot better than getting a needle stuck in your arm twice. Potential applications could also be that they use it for lung cancer. Can you imagine curing lung cancer with just a, uh, an inhaler? And that's why I like talking about this medical stuff. I get to see slow increments in the correct direction. We're seeing cancer become easier and easier to fight all the time. All of these lethal illnesses are no longer so lethal anymore because we've been able to, through genetic modification, through CRISPR specifically, we can modify these viruses and get them to do anything we want. And so we can fight cancer, we can fight bacterial infections. We could potentially use it to genetically modify ourselves to cure genetic viruses. And so I think the future is bright in the medical industry. I think it's a super, super smart idea to be using nature in our favor. Some people say we're playing God, but does it really matter if we're curing cancer, if we're curing back these terrible bacterial infections, if we're making people live better lives? Anyways, that's all I got for Tuesday, so let's move on to Wednesday. On Wednesday from iflscience.com, um, this one's more of a quote, but it says, Obama, there's footage and records of objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. UFOs, people. Essentially what the story is about is former President Barack Obama was doing an interview, and they asked him about aliens, and that's pretty much what he said. When he did get into office, he asked to be given a report on whether or not there was any alien technology in the hands of the U.S. government. The short answer is no, is basically what he said, that they don't have anything. But there is definitely these records of actual unidentified flying objects. This article was accompanied with a video showing what appears to be kind of a spherical craft of some kind, kind of moving in, in random directions, moving at sharp angles pull in something crazy like 700 G's. And if all this is true, if that's an actual alien spacecraft, that is nuts. Uh, now, there's been lots of lots and lots of sightings, and the most famous ones being the ones from the Navy pilots, where you can actually watch the entire video, and you can see this, this small tic-tac-shaped flying object flying from sea level up to like 30,000 feet in the matter of a few seconds. The advanced tracking system on these craft could not even keep track of this craft. Now, of course, the official government explanation for this is something like, oh, well, it could be tech that we're working on. It could be tech that the Russians or the, the Chinese are working on. But the thing is, is that they have no idea. These things defy a lot of laws of physics, as far as we could tell. They're pulling Gs that would kill a human. They're accelerating to speeds that even our fastest fighter jets can't hope to match. They ignore Earth's gravity like it isn't even there. And they fly in and out of water, and there is no evidence that's even putting off a, really a, much of a heat signature. In a lot of the videos, you can see these craft, and they're colder than the water around them. And what that suggests is that there isn't any kind of reactionary drive. It's some kind of reactionless drive that doesn't put off any thermals. It's Maybe it's manipulating gravity or whatever. Personally, I'm not sure whether or not to believe in aliens, although I've seen lots and lots of this footage that kind of, it's, it's like, how do you explain that rationally? How can a Chinese aircraft suddenly pull a 90, go up to 30,000 feet, fly off a radar, come back, and even our most advanced tracking systems cannot keep track of it? In a lot of these cases, the mystery craft is actually jamming our radar, which is an act of war. So it's unlikely that it's another nation. It's possible that it may be us, too, some kind of crazy advanced military tech that nobody knows about. I'm probably leaning more on the side of aliens being a real thing. And if that's the case, they're so frighteningly far ahead of what we can do. But despite the fact that they have this wildly advanced technology. They don't seem to be doing anything. They just kind of fly in, check us out, and fly out. Back in 2020, when they were trying to figure out the first COVID relief bill, former President Donald Trump put into this bill that the Pentagon was going to have to release everything it had about UFOs within something like the next 30 days. And so we're going to start seeing some of these videos coming out of the Pentagon of these unexplained aerial phenomenon. They're being tracked by ships. They're being tracked by aircraft. Many people have seen them. 
So like I said, it's either some wildly advanced tech or they're actual aliens and they're here to visit. But as I see more videos like this, I think I'm starting to get convinced that aliens are probably a real thing and that they're visiting us. What I don't understand is how come all the spacecraft are different all the time. How come some are triangles? How come some are these, these long cylinders? Why are some Tic Tacs? Why are some spheres? And etc. But anyways, that's all I got for Wednesday, so let's go ahead and move on to Thursday. For Thursday on Futurism.com, Ford's electric F-150 is poised to change the entire EV market. In 2022, Ford is going to be coming out with a truck based on their F-150 platform that's going to be fully electric, and it's going to be called the Ford F-150 Lightning. Now, that's kind of a throwback to the old F-150 Lightning that they made way back in the early 2000s, I believe, where it had a V8 engine. Now, these are very powerful. They have a pretty decent range, especially for a big electric truck. And really, it's the first baby steps into mass appeal for electric vehicles that aren't something that would be considered luxury like a Tesla. I would really, really like one. In fact, I really like electric vehicles in general. I can't personally justify it because my job requires me to drive up to 50,000 miles a year. And they would not pay me to sit at a charger and charge it up when I could just have a gasoline car, throw the gas in, and it would take me five minutes, and then I'd be on my way. Now, let's go ahead and look at some of the specs for this thing. It looks pretty cool. The base price for the standard model is going to be $40,000 with an extended range model at $55,000. The standard range one is going to go 230 miles with the extended range one going 300 miles. Of course, very respectable ranges for electric for either one of those. Um, that brings it out to, for the standard one at least, a 115 kilowatt hour battery pack. And the truck itself is going to have something like 450 horsepower. Now that's cool and all. But a lot of people would argue that you can go a lot farther on the gas, which is true, technically, on one tank. If you fill up the equivalent gas F-150, which the equivalent gas F-150 compared to the standard F-150 Lightning would be something like an F-150 XL Super Crew with a V6 3.3 liter engine and a 5.5 foot bed which would be about $36,000. So it would be cheaper than the $40,000 electric lightning. However, even with the fact that you can go 690 miles on one tank in the gas one, that's a 26 gallon tank. And at an average price of $3 per gallon, that's $78 to fill the tank. Now, if you were going to fully charge up the lightning, that's a 115 kilowatt hour pack. One kilowatt hour in the United States averages to about 13.31 cents. And it would cost about $16 to go 230 miles. So, of course, you're going to have to charge it three times as much as you'd fill up the truck. However, if you look at fueleconomy.gov and you look at their comparisons for the efficiency of gas versus electric, a gasoline engine only uses 12 to 30% of the energy that you put into it, whereas electric gets about 77% efficiency. Now, I took those numbers and I did some calculations. And it turns out that despite that the F-150 Lightning is $4,000 more expensive, it costs half as much to actually run it. Over the course of the life of the truck, let's say 150,000 miles, the electric one would only use $10,000 worth of electricity, and the gasoline version of that truck would cost as much as $18,500 to operate over 150,000 miles. And that's not including oil changes or any of the other things that go into the maintenance of an engine. Now, on the other hand, an electric truck, you have a big-ass battery. Now, the batteries are supposed to last a very long time, probably the whole practical life of the vehicle. But once you replace that battery, that battery is very expensive. You, you, it's, it'd be like replacing the engine in the gas one. So there's a lot of pros and cons. Personally, I think that electric vehicles are definitely the way to go for the future. They're quicker. They're more efficient. You can charge them at home. You don't have to go to gas stations to fill up. That's what a lot of people don't consider is like, well, how am I going to charge it up? There's no charging stations around. Well, the thing is, is while it's sitting at home, you just plug it into the wall and it charges it up and then you got a full tank every morning. Of course, there is also the problem to address with people who live in apartments and stuff like that, but that's all infrastructure questions. And eventually with a wide enough adoption of electric cars, I'm thinking we'll start to see electric charging stations in shopping mall parking lots, in apartments, at work. 
all these places that you could potentially charge your car because they don't have to set up a whole gas tank and a, a fuel system or anything. They just run some electrical cable out there. They put up a box and then they would just put it in front of a parking space. You get to work, you take the handle off the hook, you plug it into your car and then it charges while you're working. Then range anxiety wouldn't really be that big of a deal unless you were doing very long distance trips. And even then, battery technology is getting better all the time. They're coming up with these solid state batteries that can potentially charge to 80% in five minutes would be a total game changer. Or perhaps just much larger batteries that can have 800 miles of range in one go, but they take longer to charge. Now, I personally think that this truck is going to be flying off the shelves. It looks like the old F-150. It isn't much more expensive than a normal F-150. And it's powerful, and it's fast, and it's clean. But anyways, that's all I really got for Thursday, so let's move on to our final day Friday. On Friday from phys.org, tardigrades survive impacts of up to 825 meters per second. This isn't going to be a very long segment, but I did want to talk about this story because tardigrades are my favorite animal. And I'll give you a small excerpt from the article to give you an idea of why they're my favorite animal. Tardigrades are tiny eight-legged animals on the order of 0.1 centimeters in length of the phylum tardigrata. They have been given the name water bear due to their appearance. Tardigrades have made the news in recent years due to their hardiness. They were also the first known animals to survive the rigors of outer space. They were able to go without water for up to 10 years. They can survive extreme pressures and temperatures, including boiling water, and levels of UV radiation that are lethal to most other animals. To achieve these feats, the tiny creatures curl up into a ball and enter a sleep-like state. In this new effort, the researchers wanted to know if they could also survive high-speed impacts. So what they did is they froze the tardigrades to kind of get them to curl up into their sleep-like state. And then they literally loaded them into an air gun and they shot them at a pile of sand at 825 meters per second. For some of the tests, they went faster. For some of the tests, they went slower. But it looks like 825 is the highest that they could tolerate. Now, 825 meters per second is really, really, really fast. But any more than that, and the tardigrades would literally get blasted apart and they'd shred. Personally, I think it's just funny that they took them and they fired, and fired them out of a gun at 825 meters per second and they survived. They were able to resuscitate them and they just went on living normal, happy tardigrade lives. The reason why they did this was to figure out if tardigrades could have hitchhiked on an asteroid and brought life to Earth. And what they found through firing this gun is that there's no way that they could have did this because asteroids are quite a bit faster than 825 meters per second. So that was just a fun little story that I read up on. I thought it was kind of interesting. Tardigrades are my favorite animal, so I went ahead and I clicked on the story and I read it and just thought it was kind of funny that they loaded them into a gun and they just shot them at sand. I would like to work in that laboratory because it sounds like they have a lot of fun. But anyways, that's it for Friday. Thank you for listening to The Future Last Week, and I'll catch you guys next time, where we will talk about this week next week. Have a good one.